Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Circuits of Reward, Motivation, and Decisions, Linking Connectivity to Function and Disease. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This presentation has been approved for Category 1 Continuing Medical Education Credits by Loma Linda University. If you are interested in obtaining CMEs after attending this presentation, please click on the Get Your Free CME CE Credits button in the bottom left corner of the event screen. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the green screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Suzanne Haber. Dr. Haber's research focuses on the neural network underlying learning and decision making that leads to action plan development. Pathology of this network is implicated in several mental health disorders, including drug addiction, obsessive compulsive disorder, and schizophrenia. Her lab is in addressing the hypothesis that corticobasal ganglia connections are critical for integrating information across functional domains. Dr. Haber received her PhD in Neuro and Biobehavioral Sciences from Stanford University. I will now turn it over to Dr. Haber for her presentation. Good morning, um, and thank you for joining me today. I'm going to be talking about uh, circuits of reward and motivation and decisions, and linking this complex network and circuitry to function and disease. And as you can see from this beginning slide, this uh, circuitry and network is really quite complex. We won't cover all of these connections, but just a few key ones. And I'm going to emphasize particularly those that um, are associated with a number of mental health uh, disorders. On this side of the slide, you can see a human uh, brain, which is a very complex cortex, and uh, some of the uh, dysfunctions within the circuitry that you can see in some of the mental health diseases. And we'll talk about this as we go through the presentation today. But before we start that, just a little bit of history. The idea that the reward circuit or motivation uh, lies embedded within uh, in the cortex, uh, in the um, in the brain, and is not really sensory driven, but internally driven, was first described by a very classic study by Olds and Miller, in which they injected or uh, passed electrodes into various regions of the brain and asked the animal to work for particular stimulations in those areas. And as you can see, number of uh, internal structures were highly activated during these stimulation experiments. Support for this internal circuit then came from pharmacological manipulations in which intracranial um, injections of drugs abuse demonstrated those same uh, structures. In particular, uh, highlighted here are the dopamine neurons of the ventral tegmental area and the ventral striatum, as well as other structures in which the animals worked very hard to get little bits of uh, drugs of abuse um, injected into those areas. As I mentioned, though, the reward activity related is, is found throughout the brain, but particularly in these two brain regions, the midbrain dopamine cells and the nucleus accumbens ventral striatum, but also uh, prefrontal cortex. And I'm focusing a little bit more on prefrontal cortex because, of course, that's the area of the brain that makes us very human and where most of our mental health uh, problems uh, arise from. So if you just look at these two charts, you can see that the publications and the imaging studies that are related to these uh, three brain regions have really skyrocketed in the last few years. 
and in particular dopamine, the prefrontal cortex and the ventral striatum and all of the other areas combined uh, are, uh, are less uh, focused on. So I'm going to briefly talk about the dopamine neurons. It's uh, difficult to have a talk about reward without including these uh, important cells. So this is a classic a set of experiments from a number of different laboratories. Uh, Wilhelm Schultz's classic studies on the ability to demonstrate how the uh, dopamine neurons detect war, uh, reward, our reward detection error uh, cells in which when a surprising reward occurs, these cells fire uh, in response to that surprise. And this has been now um, very well demonstrated through a number of uh, future uh, recent studies to demonstrate how well the dopamine neurons are associated with reward. But even before that, of course, there are a number of uh, pharmacological studies demonstrating blocking the dopamine in blocking uh, lever pressing for amphetamine. Just to give you a little orientation, this is, of course, the, the dopamine uh, activation in a human uh, imaging study. And uh, down here in the right uh, part of this slide demonstrates the actual distribution of dopamine cells. The classic VTA, ventral tegmental area dopamine, that's been associated with reward. But as Wolfram Schultz's studies so clearly show, many of the cells in the um, substantia nigra pars compacta also demonstrate response to reward. And in this section, we see a human a uh, coronal section stain for TH, which is um, one of the enzymes associated with dopamine. And you can see the distribution of the dopamine cells in this uh, slide. The nucleus accumbens, again, is way of orientation. This is in the ventral striatum. Uh, and many studies have demonstrated also the activation of these cells during a reward paradigm. To human studies, again, demonstrating the activation in the ventral striatum um, during tasks that are associated with reward prediction error and with um, various kinds of uh, reward in terms of receiving particular uh, monetary rewards for tasks. In this lower panel, we have a little orientation of the human um, brain, a, cor a coronal section with the uh, caudate nucleus, um, the internal capsule, the putamen, and the ventral striatum, also referred to as the nucleus accumbens, and I'm going to be using those two uh, terms fairly interchangeably. And finally, the last area we'll be talking about is prefrontal cortex, and specifically we're going to be talking about uh, three different areas. The orbital and anterior cingulate cortex, which can be divided into what I'm referring to here is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And that includes areas uh, 32 and 25, this region, uh, and parts of 10. And this area, uh, right, you, you can't see it very well because it's embedded here in the midline. The orbital cortex, which is uh, on the uh, orbital uh, surface of the brain, and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex which uh, is uh, in this more dorsal region around the corpus callosum. And these three areas have been associated uh, with different diseases. The ventral medial prefrontal cortex is associated, among other things, with uh, uh, chronic depression and um, fear and PTSD. Uh, the orbital cortex is associated with obsessive compulsive disorder and addiction, and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex is linked to many, many different psychiatric diseases, including OCD, addiction, schizophrenia, and a whole host of others. And again, uh, just to give you some uh, background in the activation of these areas uh, during reward and motivation, and this was um, one of many, many different studies demonstrating activation during a reward uh, probabilistic task in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and um, up into the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and over into the orbital uh, prefrontal cortex.
Now these three areas, although they're very uh, clearly linked to uh, each other, as well as in general um, decision making, they seem to have somewhat different um, functional um, uh, uh, domains. The ventral medial prefrontal cortex is important in computing a chosen value. Do I like raisins better than apples, for example? The OFC is uh, important for linking a stimulus to their values. In other words, very critical in learning and pairing different actions with, uh, with a value. And the dorsal anterior cingulate is important in uh, monitoring errors and uh, conflict to switch behaviors. Have I had enough apples and do I now need some uh, raisins? or do I want to make this choice versus that choice? And so these areas have been shown with a number of studies to have slightly different um, functional uh, attributes. What I wanna talk about in this particular uh, address then is how these three areas interact with the basal ganglia and in particular focus on this basal ganglia cortical uh, reward network but importantly, how those uh, connections interface with both cognitive and motor circuits that help us develop action plans and habits. That is, as we move through life, we make decisions and those decisions are based on motivation and reward, but ultimately uh, result in a particular motor action. The second part of the talk, which as you'll see will be somewhat related to the first, is how the pathways or the white matter or the connections of these areas get to their targets. And this is very important in this connectivity profiles for understanding neuroimaging studies and uh, abnormalities in the diseases. And I'm gonna use deep brain stimulation, which is a targeted approach, uh, therapeutic approach for psychiatric and neurological disorders as an example for how one can think about specific pathways and connections being associated with um, disabilities. So to start with, I'm gonna start with uh, how the reward circuit uh, as part of the basal ganglia is actually put together. And many of you may already know that the basal ganglia has been classically part of the motor system uh, but in the late 70s, Leonard Heimer demonstrated that a part of the uh, limbic cortex actually projected to a region that we refer to as the striatum. And uh, so he demonstrated that not only the motor system projected to the striatum, but the limbic system did as well. And that projected uh, as the um, motor system did to the output nuclei of the substantia nigra and the pallidum. Those projected then to the, a part of the thalamus and back to the cortex, which is the classic direct uh, cortical basal ganglia pathway. In addition, there's the classic indirect pathway through the subthalamic nucleus, again, um, part of the limbic pathway as well as the uh, motor pathway. And then finally, there's a hyperdirect pathway from the cortex to the STN. So that's your basic uh, uh, circuitry. In addition, the ventral striatum has a unique projection uh, which uh, gets information both by hippocampus and the amygdala. After this circuit had been demonstrated, um, Alexander and DeLong et al. That showed that the basal ganglia really was uh, comprised of several different circuits, including this limbic circuit that I just described, but a motor circuit and a cognitive circuit, et cetera. And they discussed the idea that this, uh, pa these pathways were segregated and, um, and parallel in their processing. But about the same time that um, the ventral system was discovered, those working in psychiatry and in, um, in the ventral system realized that there had to be ways in which the limbic or the reward system, the cognitive system and the motor system were integrated and didn't just simply uh, operate in a parallel pathway because through an integration, we begin to 
understand how motivation can impact on cognition and our motor plans. And I'm going to talk now about three places in which this integration can occur through the basal ganglia. There are other areas, but these are the key ones that I want to focus on today. First of all, I'm going to talk about the cortical, um, the striatal dopamine striatal connection. I'm going to talk about the cortical striatal connection. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the hyperdirect pathway to the STN. So the idea about uh, uh, integration across the, the dopamine neurons also has a history. And we know that the striatum projects to the pars reticulata of the substantia nigra, but they also project densely to the dopamine neurons. And Nauda um, in the late 70s showed that in the rodent, the um, striatum projected to the uh, dopamine neurons in a larger area and therefore had the opportunity to impact on motor regions of the striatum. And this was then demonstrated using EM as well. We then showed that the, um, the reciprocal connections between these two was very complicated. Here's um, the limbic area of the striatum, the cognitive area of the striatum, and in blue, the motor areas of the striatum. And what we showed was that there were three components of this reciprocal connection within the substantia nigra. First and um, most commonly thought of it was the reciprocal com component. What that means was that projections from the ventral striatum to the nigra and the nigra dopamine neurons back to the striatum uh, were um, from the same regions of each area. That was true for the limbic, the cognitive, and motor. Moreover, however, you can see these little dots. These dots represent the cells that are projecting back to these um, functionally uh, identified regions of the striatum. Here are the blue dots that are pro projecting to the motor region, yellow dots to the um, cognitive region, and red dots to the limbic region. What that demonstrates is that these projections to those areas are not embedded within the, within the terminal fields of that functional region. And likewise, what you have here are terminals with no dots. That means this region is getting input from cognitive rate areas, but not projecting to it. When we put these uh, together, what you find is that not only does the limbic region project back to the limbic region, it also projects to cells that terminate in the more dorsal areas or the cognitive areas. And these then project also to a region of the nigra that in turn projects to the motor. So we have a kind of a spiral um, movement from limbic to cognitive to motor parts of the striatum. And this is actually demonstrated also in, across different species of animals as indicated here in a rodent study. And using that kind of design, what we, um, uh, Barry Everett and his colleagues demonstrated that the spiral between the limbic, cognitive, and motor uh, aspects of the striatal nigra striatal connection was very important um, to that and underlies the shift from an action outcome to stimulus response mechanisms in the control over drug seeking. And in this study um, by Linda Perino et al. shows how uh, after chronic cocaine use, the movement of glucose utilization moves from the ventral to the dorsal uh, striatum, presumably through this mechanism. So what that said was, as the cortex is projecting to these various different parts of the striatum, the striatum and the nigra itself are um, interacting in a way in which the ventral parts of the striatum influence over time the more dorsal parts or the motor output parts of the striatum. But what about this cortical input? 
we now turn to our, um, our interest into how these projections from the regions I was referring to um, impact on the striatum itself. <clears throat> According to the parallel pathways um, connectivity profile that was uh, demonstrated by Alexander DeLong, et cetera, if this parallel processing occurred, then all of these areas should be um, projecting to the striatum in a point-to-point -point, uh, manner. But what we found was, in fact, um, that isn't entirely the case. Again, there's history behind this. We find that there's many different studies that shows, for example, no part of the caudate or putamen is under the sole influence of one functional region of cortex. And here's a, just a few of the quotes that have demonstrated the history of knowing that or understanding that these projection systems are much more complex. And here's a study in the rat, which was very um, beautifully demonstrated that one uh, axon, cortical axon in the striatum really occupies a large part of the striatum. So in looking at the striatum, we also know that there are many parts of the um, uh, striatum that contain reward activ related activity that are found in the dorsal parts of the striatum. And here are three studies that demonstrate that. Thus, reward is not just limited to the ventral striatum. We looked at this more closely, and what you can see in this figure is the inputs, first of all, from the three cortical regions that I was referring to, the VMPFC, the OFC, and the dorsal anterior cingulate. And what you can see in this coronal section, this is a frontal view, a medial view, and a lateral view, and here's just the coronal section through those, each of these squiggly lines are, um, is a projection system from slightly different parts of these regions. They're color coded so that red is from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, fuchsia from orbital and yellow or orange, sorry, um, from the dorsal anterior cingulate. And you can see that there's a general topography as you would expect, but look beyond the topography to note all of the interactions that are potentially taking place. On the medial wall, you pretty much have the ventral medial prefrontal and orbital, but as you move a little bit more laterally, you get quite a bit of mixture from all of these uh, areas. And interestingly, collectively, these studies show that these three areas associated with motivation and reward occupy a large part of the striatum. <clears throat> Moreover, this would be our classic ventral striatum, but you can see that this actually occupies quite a bit of the caudate, the ventral part of the caudate and the ventral part of the putamen. If we, we superimpose additional inputs from cognitive regions, and this is the dorsal and lateral prefrontal cortex, areas that are no, noted for cognition and executive function. What you see again is uh, the topography as, as one expects, but then again, look through this um, complexity and you begin to see how uh, these nodes in between these are areas in which convergence between these projections occur. And this occurs mainly in the rostral part of the striatum. If we look at this in the human um, brain using probabilistic tractography, two different studies demonstrate a very similar uh, organization. First of all, there's the uh, topography that you expect, but again, looking at the orange regions and the um, uh, light green regions, you begin to see that there's quite a lot of convergence between uh, limbic areas and cognitive areas, cognitive areas and um, premotor areas and premotor areas and motor areas. Moreover, interestingly, you can, it also demonstrates 
the large area, almost 25% of the striatum, again, mostly in the rostral part of the striatum, that is associated with these um, reward motivation functions. Executive function in this study shows almost 50% or uh, a little more than 50%. And despite the fact that um, the basal ganglia are th thought of being motor uh, structures, you can see that in fact, now that we look at it more in detail, we can see that the motor aspect, or let's say the purely motor um, parts of the basal ganglia are relatively small. If we look at these probabilistic maps in the striatum, and this is an area, this is sort of a map showing where more than one projection system uh, terminates. And this one that I've outlined here has four different areas, dorsal anterior cingulate, um, orbital, ventrolateral, and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so two cognitive and two limbic areas, and also um, caudal, uh, cingulate cortex and parietal cortex. And you can see that these areas um, form then potentially a, um, a potential node here within the striatum that's important for um, integrating across different functions. We wanted to know whether or not the, there's the possibility that these um, are functional nodes. And this is some preliminary data using uh, resting state data and using a seed placed in the region of the striatum that we feel should uh, has these con um, convergent inputs. And what you can see from the resting state data is as we would predict um, areas in the um, anterior cingulate, in the dorsal prefrontal cortex, the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, ventral medial, um, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, and parietal cortex, suggesting that these um, nodes that we see using probabilistic um, methods also have a functional uh, underpinning. So uh, I should say that the reverse, that within the functional data, we can see that the structural underpinnings um, are consistent with that. We'll return to the uh, idea of different parts of the striatum having these convergent inputs uh, later in the talk. So in conclusion to this part, we see that there's a convergence between different reward processing regions um, and that the dorsal, anterior, and orbital cortex also converge, especially in the rostral part of the striatum which creates um, certain uh, sites that may be particularly important in incentive-based learning and also may be particularly important switch points that may be affected in disease. Uh, the last slide I'm gonna talk about in terms of the integration across is the hyperdirect pathway. Again, the cortical inputs to the basal ganglia system um, are particularly important in understanding how the system is integrated. And so we asked the question whether the hyperdirect pathway to the STN, uh, this is again a review of the, uh, of the STN's place in the, in the um, cortical basal ganglia system. This is the indirect pathway embedded here, but the hyperdirect pathway is the way in which cortex impacts directly on the STN. And <clears throat> here we can see a charting of the pathways from different parts of cortex. Again, the details are not important. The main point is if you look at the color coding, similar to what I showed before, you see that here's a coronal section of the STN, the limbic part, in this medial region, the motor part in the dorsal and lateral area, the cognitive part embedded in the middle and the premotor area somewhere in between. What you can see is there's a topography as we saw in the cortical striatal connections, but a lot of overlap. Again, the reason I'm bringing this up is that we will look at this in more detail when we get to the deep brain stimulation as we pass electrodes for various therapies through these regions, we want to be clear 
about what areas we really want to stimulate. So we'll be coming back to this as well. So what I'd like to do now is switch um, to the pathways that connect these areas. And as I mentioned, it's um, critical to know how they get to those targets. And here we'll be talking mainly about the cortical targets, not the basal ganglia targets, and the implications of these pathways for understanding imaging studies. And as I said, I will be talking about deep brain stimulation as an example of how we can specifically target pathways and connections. <clears throat> so first of all, a little bit of review of the history of the um, imaging studies, which has really exploded in the last few years. These imaging sh studies show abnormalities in connectivity profiles in many different psychiatric diseases. And this um, chart just demonstrates the MRI um, studies in MRI, demonstrating MRI abnormalities in um, these uh, uh, five, uh, five diseases, schizophrenia, depression, OCD, PTSD, and addiction. And in this um, uh, screen, we see the diffusion imaging of the white matter tracts that connect these areas that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and that includes the white matter tracts, particularly the corpus callosum, internal capsule, and the cingulum bundle. And you can see how uh, these have exploded as well, and now they're uh, very much associated with different diseases. So what is diffusion imaging? It's, um, it's a way in which one can look at white matter integrity in the white matter and to track particular pathways. It's a sequence that um, studies axonal structure and bundle coherence, and it's a measurement of water diffusion molecules across white matter, and therefore it is an indirect measure of pathways. And as I mentioned, it's used to link connectivity with abnormalities in particular areas. And here are three different studies that show the red that's uh, identified, you can see the white matter uh, in, in these um, uh, studies and the, right, and the uh, red indicates abnormalities in the FA values. In this uh, slide expressed in depressed versus healthy controls. This um, slide is demonstrating a study in OCD and, um, and this is also in, in depressed individuals. Uh, compared to healthy controls. And what you can see is that in these white matters, you don't see the entire white matter outlined in FA, uh, high FA values, but here, for example, a specific part of the internal capsule, a specific part of the corpus callosum. And the question is, what specific fibers might be going through those regions? So what I'm gonna do first is define the organization of our fibers through the white matter. And I'm only going to give you some examples of understanding some organizational rules in which the fiber is used to get to where they're going. We'll talk a little bit about the ability to segment these bundles then based on functional connections. <clears throat> the implications for understanding and interpreting the imaging studies I just showed you and then importantly, using this data to understand the abnormalities that we see in, um, in MRI and how we can think about what we're targeting in specific um, kinds of therapeutic approaches, deep brain stimulation being the example of what I'm gonna show you. So the first thing um, I'm gonna do is tell you a little bit about one rule. And the rule is on the ventral surface, this is a coronal section of the ventral surface, this is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex in the orbital. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you about one rule, which is the medial lateral cortical, cortical position dictates where the fibers will travel um, in the internal capsule and in the corpus callosum. 
So let's talk about the internal capsule. As fibers from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex enter the internal capsule, they come up through the ventral surface. They pass through and they move uh, more dorsally. In contrast, those from the lateral surface arc around and come into the internal ca capsule from the dorsal surface and move ventrally. The result is Those that are in the medial region occupy the ventral part of the internal capsule, and those are in the lateral region occupy a more dorsal perspective. The other thing that's important to point out is you can see that the internal capsule doesn't end at the anterior commissure, but actually goes through the anterior commissure and uh, and include some fascicles that are underneath the anterior commissure. The same is true with the corpus callosum. The medial uh, fibers from the medial region cross the corpus callosum ventral to those from the lateral parts of the orbital circus circuit, which um, cross more dorsally. So what that means then, and if I can go back one slide, what mean, that means is I want you to think about the internal capsule then as starting to be segmented according to what passes through each of these places. This is no longer just a combination of random fibers, but actually has a clear organization, as does the corpus callosum. I'm going to be showing you a, a film right now that shows the, um, and I, since I can't speak during the film, I want to describe what you're going to see. You're going to see the injection site, an injection site here in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and the flow of the fibers as they um, pass through different areas. What you will first see is um, a little bit of an orientation of the brain. The injection site will come on or the seed that we placed will come on. You will see the fibers growing. They don't actually grow, of course, but they go through the uh, uncinate fasciculus. They'll go through the cingulum bundle. They will then um, pass through the internal capsule. They will divide into the thalamus and brainstem. And the amygdala fugal pathway will come out. And then you will um, also see a fiber pathway to, um, to the, uh, another fiber pathway to the amygdala. So if we could show the film. Okay, um, the next film you're going to see is uh, going to be that same. Let's see. The next film you'll see is a film of um, all three areas, all these three areas together 
to give you the um, understanding of how these uh, different fibers relate to each other. I want you to particularly identify the um, internal capsule and the corpus callosum and their organization uh, in, in those bundles. Could we have the next film, please? Okay, so in the last film, you saw the, uh, a deep brain stimulation electrode uh, entering into the internal capsule, which is one of the sites. And so now we're going to switch to deep brain stimulation, and I'd like the, the next film, please. is made up of millions of connections between neurons that control movement and behavior. Different areas of the brain have different regulatory effects on these neural networks. Disruption of the regulatory portions of these networks leads to various neurologic and psychological diseases such as Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. Deep brain stimulation has been found to relieve the symptoms of certain of these diseases that are resistant to medications. Deep brain stimulation involves surgically inserting an electrode into the central portion of the brain in the part called the basal ganglia. The electrode is then connected to a generator similar to a cardiac pacemaker. The rapid firing of the electrode interrupts the abnormal networks relieving symptoms such as tremor and muscle rigidity in Parkinson's disease. Before current medical therapy was available, Parkinson's disease was treated with ablative surgery, which involved the non-reversible destruction of brain tissue. With deep brain stimulation, the firing of the electrode can be adjusted in an outpatient setting in order to control the symptoms but to minimize unwanted side effects. Currently, deep brain stimulation is approved by the FDA for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia resistant to medical therapy. Ongoing research is studying the treatment of severe depression and obsessive compulsive disorder by stimulating alternative areas of the brain. Okay, so now we're going to switch to um, deep brain stimulation. And again, as I mentioned, this is um, not only an interesting therapeutic approach, but also want to use this as a way of emphasizing the importance of understanding the connectivity that we've been talking about so far in this lecture. So there are a couple of different targets that are um, have been used now worldwide in various groups. Um, probably the most prominent one, uh, which is why I uh, talk a little bit about the STN, is the subthalamic nucleus for Parkinson's disease. Uh, this target is also now being explored for obsessive compulsive disorder 
in the more medial parts of the target, uh, mostly in the um, in some of the European uh, experimental um, uh, 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 groups. Um, mental health disorders um, have been uh, focused mainly on OCD and depression, but also on addiction. And the targets here in the US are mainly the internal capsule and the ventral striatum uh, and the subgenual cingulate white matter. These are the ones I'm gonna focus on, but I'm aware that, and we all are aware, I think that there are a number of other targets that people are experimenting with throughout the brain. But these are the ones that have probably been um, investigated the most, uh, the most so far. Here's the internal capsule target. We'll talk a little bit about that one, the, inter, uh, the STN. We'll start actually with the STN target, the um, ventral striatal target, um, the internal capsule, and the subgenual white matter target. So as uh, I showed you before, uh, the pathways that are connecting the cortical pathways and the hyperdirect pathway that connects the STN. And of course, we didn't go over the um, palatal, palatal indirect connections, but let's focus on the electrode in the uh, hyperdirect pathway. Here's the a model of the electrode. You can see the four contacts. Uh, you can stimulate each of these separately or in combination. And what you can see is that if you are aiming for the motor areas, which are the blue regions, you probably want to um, activate your more dorsal and lateral contact. And if you are um, interested in um, affecting uh, more of the mental health areas, uh, in particular OCD, uh, you're going to aim more closely to the um, more medial uh, and ventral um, areas. Uh, let me give you, uh, I have one small film on the internal capsule. If we could show that one now, that would be great. So what you saw there were the cortical fibers that are going through the um, internal capsule and not limited to the uh, areas that I had um, focused on before, but also including the medial prefrontal cortex, um, the anterior cingulate, et cetera. And now you can see again in the different four contacts that we have, depending on the contact that uh, is activated, will depend on which fiber pathways or which combination of fiber pathways you're going to likely be activating. The advantage of these um, methods is that as the patient's outcomes are evaluated, one can change which particular contact is being activated in the parameters and therefore um, to affect the, most, the best outcome possible. And of course, this is in contrast to a lesion where, of course, the, um, uh, it's uh, irreversible. So this is um, a big advantage. And you can see how many options you might have uh, in this uh, using this um, technique. We talked about the connections in the cortical striatal connections. And I just wanted to, again, think about if you were doing DBS for OCD in the ventral striatum or for addiction. Again, placing your uh, electrode in the ventral striatum, this whole region, these little stars, because it's difficult to see the contacts, indicate uh, the contact points within the striatum. And again, you can see that if you, in general, when we stimulate very, very ventrally, uh, it's not as an effective site because you might have quite a bit of anxiety there, as you can imagine you have a lot of the very uh, 
basic limbic structures passing through here. Uh, and as you move up, you um, begin to uh, activate or capture fibers, not only from limbic regions, but from more, some of the more cognitive regions, the dorsal anterior cingulate, et cetera. Once again, like the DBS for um, the internal capsule, you can see it's a very similar trajectory. Uh, you have lots of different uh, options and potential choices. <clears throat> um, DBS in the subgenual um, cingulum, which has been a target for depression, you can see the white matter here uh, really is, uh, activates or um, involves, I'm sorry, the white matter here, lots of different um, pa potential pathways. And here I have a schematic below of those pathways that are likely to be uh, involved in, again, each of these um, contacts. In the most medial and ventral position, of course, you will activate all of the areas or capture fibers from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and in this entire region. You also will be uh, capturing many fibers from more lateral areas that are passing through the electrode to uh, go to other parts of cortex. The, the more dorsal contacts will be capturing part of the ventral aspects of the corpus callosum. And if you'll recall, the ventral aspects of the corpus callosum, uh, again, carry a lot of the medial fibers from this region. So um, what gets uh, stimulated at the different targets are, are somewhat different. Uh, each target and each contact will have a different combination of fibers that could contribute to the therapeutic effect. Just comparing here the subgenual and the, um, the uh, internal capsule and the ventral striatum, you will, in both of those, you'll be getting the ascending and descending thalamic and brainstem fibers. In the subgenual, you will um, also be capturing many of the cortical and subcortical uh, projections that are coming from areas near the electrode. Uh, this will be capturing cortical, cortical, direct cortical, cortical connections while the um, internal capsule uh, won't. The main point then is that um, we can segment white matter bundles much as we do the gray matter with specific areas within each bundle that's associated with reward and cognitive control connectivity. And um, allowing us then to think about um, imaging studies, and this is uh, one of many, this is by Rita Goldstein, and looking at uh, drug addicted versus um, control subjects, and you can see that the uh, FA values change, in, as I mentioned before, in specific parts of the internal capsule and in the um, cingulum bundle and the corpus callosum. And by understanding, and here we have uh, the other studies that I showed you before, um, by understanding how these different pathways uh, are passed through these different systems, we begin to have a better idea about what connectivity is actually interrupted during these um, uh, uh, diseases. So in conclusion then to the whole talk, I'd like to mention again that we talked about crosstalk between basal ganglia circuits through several levels in the network. And I only highlighted three of those, the cortical striatal, the cortical nigrostriatal and the um, cortical STN, but it provides a anatomical mechanism for integrating across reward and value into decision-making. And I also showed you evidence that this structural connectivity is then played out also in functional connectivity in terms of um, some of the functional resting state uh, distributed networks that we see. Moreover, this helps us uh, think about targets and ways of approaching uh, different parts of the basal cortical basal ganglia circuit for therapeutic uh, disease, approaches to disease. Moreover, I also talked about how pathways between related cortical areas follow specific rules to get to their target. 
And this allows us to segment white matter much the way we do um, gray matter in terms of function and explore in more detail how abnormality in connections that we see in diffusion studies uh, can be linked to specific connections and helping us understand um, some of the therapeutic invasive targets such as uh, deep brain stimulation or lesions or even non-invasive um, ones as we move forward to non-invasive ones such as TMS. And, um, and that's it. There are many people in the lab that I'd like to thank. And if, I, if there's time for questions, I'm happy to, to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Haber, for that interesting presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer period, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question refers to slide 37. Please explain the yellow dots more. Is each one a functioning synapse or a fiber bundle? Uh, is, I hope this is the slide you are referring to, slide 37. Each of these is um, indicating the fibers. Uh, so this area, we're, we're, we're tracking the fibers that are coming from this part of cortex into the internal capsule. So the fibers, these are the axons would leave this region and move dorsally through the subcaudate white matter into the internal capsule. These are fibers from this region of cortex. The reason they look um, as if they are interrupted and it's not one fiber bundle is because they are traveling through these small fascicles. These are these white matter fascicles you can see one here budding off. So they are fibers that are going into, uh, into the internal capsule. Thank you, Dr. Haber. Fortunately, we are out of time. We want to thank our audience for their interesting questions and participation in today's event. And I'd like to thank Dr. Suzanne Haber for her informative presentation. Today's webcast will be available or on-demand viewing for the next few months, and you'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you to when this webcast will be available for replay. We encourage you to share this email with any colleagues who may have missed today's event. Thank you very much for your attendance. See you next time.